Bible here this morning. Grab it and open it with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can grab one of the Bibles that we provide here at United in the back of the room. You can grab one of those, but everybody needs one. And you need to open it right now with me to Matthew chapter 6 as we continue here today our study of Jesus' warnings against hypocrisy. So far in Matthew chapter 6, over the past couple of weeks, we've seen Jesus warn us about two things. He's warned us about hypocritical giving, and then he's also warned us about hypocritical praying. And today we're going to study Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 24 on the topics of hypocritical fasting and storing up treasure in heaven. And so I want you actually right now to stand up with me out of respect for God's word for our public reading of scripture. We're going to read the words of Jesus. Follow along with me beginning in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. It says this, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness! No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. That's the reading of God's word. You can go ahead and have your seat. Now, I want to start here this morning by saying that I am just like you. I like food. Anybody else like food? Yeah, got some of your attentions. I would probably even go so far as to say I don't like food. I love food. Okay, if I can, I like to partake every day in the five major meals of every day. Do you know what I'm talking about? We got breakfast, we got lunch. We got after lunch snack. You got to have after lunch snack every single day. If you don't have after lunch snack, you're missing out on life. You got your Cheez-Its, your goldfish. I don't know what you get down with. Costco pub mix for me personally. But then you got dinner. And then after dinner, what do you have? Some of you guys go for dessert. I go for second dinner. That's what I do. <laughs> Round two leftovers, second portion, baby. Not a big dessert guy for myself personally, but just give me some more dinner. Okay, I like food. And we can say here this morning that food is good. Now, I know here at United, we don't say amen a lot, but that would be a part where some of you guys, especially some of you guys, if you know what I'm saying, would say amen. Food is good. And that's not just something that like our stomachs can agree with. That's actually what the Bible teaches. Did you know that? Here, here's what the Bible teaches. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So here's what the Bible teaches, everybody. Food is good. Uh, now we could say amen. We could go to in and out right now. We could apply this sermon. We could call it a day. And not only does the Bible say that food is good, the Bible even says you can and should receive it, i.e. eat a lot of it and be thankful. 
Thank God for the food that you have. So much so that according to this passage, Paul is warning Timothy about false teachers that the church is supposed to avoid who uh, require abstinence from foods. Who require a fake kind of spirituality where they determine how spiritual they are by avoiding food that God has created to eat. Now, food is good, and God wants you to receive it with thankfulness. That presents us with an interesting challenge here today. Because Jesus says, look back at it with me, Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, when you fast. Now, do you know what fasting is? Fasting is when you choose not to eat, and sometimes when you choose not to drink liquids for a specific time period and purpose. And we know Jesus fasted. Okay, look back at Matthew chapter 4 with me in your Bibles. Look at verse 2. As Jesus was preparing himself for his ministry that he was going to do, he went out into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And I want you to notice what it says at the end of verse 2 because every time I read this, I always think it's the biggest understatement ever. The last three words in verse 2 says that he was hungry. And I always think to myself every single time I read that, no, duh. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I skip one meal, I don't just get hungry, I get hangry. Has that ever happened to you? Where I start getting mad, like you bother me and you start getting under my skin, and why? Because I haven't eaten. And so Jesus, he's fasting in preparation for the work that he's about to go and do for his Father in heaven. Not only did Jesus fast, we know that the early church fasted. Hey, turn with me to Acts chapter 13 in your Bible, and you'll see another example of fasting. The early church fasting. It says this in Acts chapter 13 verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And then look at this verse 2 of Acts 13. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so here in this passage, we see the early church is fasting and specifically it's connected to two things in this passage. One fasting is connected to their worship and then it's connected to their praying. As the church is gathering together, there's times where they are worshiping. They're singing songs and they're lifting up their praise to God, expressing their thanksgiving to him for who he is and what he has done. And in that expression of praise, they are going without food to communicate their desire for him. But also, as they're praying, they're laying their hands on two missionaries, Barnabas and Saul, that they're about to send out to go and do gospel preaching, ministry work for Jesus Christ. It's a very epic moment in a church service where two of their very own are about to go and spread the gospel on this missionary journey. And so they're praying and they're fasting over them, committing their work to the Lord. And so we see Jesus fasted. We see the early church fasted even after Jesus was gone. And now Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6, when you fast. So he assumes there will come times in the lives of his followers when they will choose not to eat food or drink water. And so we've got to think about that. If food is good and we should thank God for the food that we have to eat, then what might be some reason... Why, there might come a time in your life where you would choose to not eat food or drink liquids for a specific time and purpose. Well, I believe Jesus answers that question for us in a very helpful way in Matthew chapter 9. Grab your Bible and turn there with me. Matthew chapter 9, and you'll see in verse 14, 
some disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and they ask him what I think is a sincere question. This is different than other times when people will come to Jesus, like the Pharisees sometimes will come to him and they'll ask him a question, but sometimes it's to trick Jesus and they want to stump Jesus and they want to disprove him because they don't like him. Well, here the disciples of John the Baptist are coming to Jesus with a question and I think it's a sincere question. It's a real one. They want to know his answer. It says this, Matthew chapter 9, look at verse 14. Then the disciples of John, so this is John the Baptist, he's got some followers and they're coming to Jesus and they're saying to him, here's their question, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? So you can see, here are John the Baptist's disciples and they're coming to Jesus and it really seems like this is a sincere question. Hey, we as disciples of John, we fast. The Pharisees over there, they fast. But we've been watching you and your disciples. They don't fast. How come? Well, Jesus, he says this in verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. And you read that and right away you're like, Oh, it makes so much sense, right? Oh, that's so helpful. Jesus, thank you so much for clarifying this. No, nobody thinks that. It's like, wait, we were talking about not eating food and drinking liquids, and all of a sudden you bring up a wedding? How does that help us understand this? How many of you guys here this morning have been to a wedding before? Anybody been to a wedding? Okay, lots of hands going up in the room. Are weddings sad times or joyous times? Joyous, Joyous, right? You don't see a lot of people sad crying at weddings. You don't see a lot of people mourning at weddings. Why? Well, because a wedding is a time when people are brought together, right? Funerals are times where you see people sad crying because we're remembering that someone has been taken away from us. And Jesus is saying in this example that he is the groom. And he's saying that his disciples don't need to fast because they are the bride and they are being united with Jesus and he is right there with him, with them. His physical presence is there with the disciples. So they don't need to fast because they're joined in a relationship with him and they've got him. But there's coming a time, Jesus says, where his followers will not have his physical presence there with him. Where the groom will be taken. We're, we're still married to Jesus. We've still got a relationship with Jesus. But Jesus isn't here. Right? His physical presence isn't somewhere that we could go touch. He's not someone that we could go and see or talk to later today in a real kind of a way like me and you are doing right now. No, that's not the case anymore. So we're in relationship with Jesus. We are married to Jesus, so to speak, as Christians, but he is no longer with us. And Jesus is saying, hey, the disciples don't need to fast right now because they've got me. So Jesus helps us understand fasting in two ways. One, he connects fasting to mourning or sadness. And there might come times in your life when you're feeling so sad, you're so broken over something that you might go without food to express your desire in prayer to God for him to make the situation right. We see David do that after he's confronted in his sin and warned that his son is going to die as a consequence for his sin. He goes, he prays, and he fasts because he's overcome with sadness and mourning. But the second thing that we see Jesus clearly connect fasting to here in this example is a longing for his presence. He's saying, hey, my disciples, they don't need to fast because they've got me right now. I'm here with them. They want to talk to me? Talk to me. They want to touch me? Touch me. I am here. We've got a relationship. But there's coming a time in my followers' lives where I will not be there with them anymore. Anybody want to take a guess? What time is he talking about? He's talking about our time. He's talking about the time that you and I are living in, where we are disciples of Jesus if we've got a relationship with him. But he is not here. He says, this is the time that people might want to fast because they want him so bad. They long for him so much 
that they express that through prayer and fasting. See, the example here is something that we can understand. You know that feeling you get when you're super hungry? When food has been taken away from you and your body literally tells you how much you want it? Jesus is saying, have you ever longed for me that much? Like you know what it's like to hunger and desire for food when you don't have it. Have you ever felt that way about being in the presence of Jesus? Do you desire him that much that you might actually go without food as an expression of you saying to Jesus, just like my body wants food right now, my soul wants you. And the things of the soul are even more important to me at times in my life than the things of my body. There's this guy, I don't know if you've heard of him before. He's kind of a modern day theologian. His name's John Piper. Anybody heard of John Piper? John Piper, he wrote this book on fasting called Hungry for God. And he has this quote in it that I really like. We're going to throw it up here on the screen. He says, the weakness of our hunger for God is not because he is unsavory, but because we keep ourselves stuffed with other things. Perhaps then the denial of our stomach's appetite for food might express or even increase our soul's appetite for God. And I think in a lot of ways John Piper is right. Because the Bible says in Psalm 34 verse 8, Oh taste and see that the Lord is good. But the problem is, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, we're so often filled up with the fake goodness that this world offers that we don't even have the ability to taste and see because we're full. And it's not that God isn't good. It's that we're so filled up with the fake goodness that this world has to offer. We don't even have the ability to taste and see. Write this down for point number one here this morning. Develop a hunger for God. See, I think, honestly, the truth is, guys, the point of this text in Matthew chapter 6 is clear and obvious. Jesus is, he, he's saying, the point is, don't fast to show off. Like, if you fast, if there comes that time in your life, like, it's fine if other people know about it, but the goal is supposed to be that you would do it just because you want the Father. You're motivated by pleasing Him. So I don't think that this is confusing, but we could agree here this morning, there is so much confusion today about the topic of fasting. And I don't think it's because it's an unclear topic in the Bible. I think it's because this idea feels so removed and disconnected from us today. And I think the reason why is because John Piper hits it right at the heart of our lives. It's not confusing. No, it's we're so filled up with the things of this world that we would never even think about doing something like fasting as an expression of our desire for God in prayer and fasting because, well, not because he's unsavory, just because I don't really feel a need you got to ask yourself here this morning, do you hunger for God? Do you long for the presence of Jesus so much that you would describe it at times the same way that you feel when you're super hungry? See, we, we know what that's like. But do we know what it's like to feel that way for Jesus? Whether that's being with him in heaven, we want that so bad. Or whether that's spending time with him in prayer, being in his presence. Do you long for it? Do you desire it? See, this is why it was so helpful for me this week as I was studying Matthew chapter 6 to see what Jesus teaches on fasting as connected to what he goes on to say about storing up treasure in heaven. Okay, if you're not there, go back there with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. Because honestly, I always saw these two things as two things that were disconnected. And while I do think that they can, and even at times should, stand on their own, it was so helpful for me to see what Jesus says about fasting and then what he goes on to say about storing up treasure in heaven. Look at what he says, Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. He says in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So notice what Jesus is saying here in this passage. Because he's now saying it in the command form. And he's saying it to you. Don't live for this life. That's the idea of storing up treasure. What are you living for? He says, don't live for this life. If you store up your treasure here on earth, it's all temporary. And he makes that clear by saying three different things. Hey, moths can come and eat it. Rust can come and destroy it. Thieves can come and steal it. All of the things that we work so hard, that we want so badly to get in this life, they're not going to last. It's all temporary. And instead, Jesus offers you the opportunity to live for something better. To live for something that will last, that is worth it. He says, store up treasure in heaven. Live your life now for eternity. Decide today that everything you do is not going to be about what feels best in the moment, what you want most now, but what's going to matter most a hundred years from now. Go with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. Everybody, Luke chapter 12. And I want to show you the difference between storing up treasure on earth versus storing up treasure in heaven. What would that even look like? Because Jesus is telling you, he's commanding you, do not lay up treasure here on earth. And the reason why is because it's all going to burn. None of it is going to last. This world and its desires are passing away. And that's exactly the message that Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 12 with a parable. The parable of the rich fool. He says this in Luke 12 verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus says back to this man, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? He said, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, just wanting more and more stuff. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, which is the exact opposite, if we're being honest, of how most of us think today. Most of us, our life does consist in the abundance of possessions. Getting the coolest shoes, the nicest clothes, looking the best, having the best games, whatever it is, if I got that, Bam! Life is going well for me. Jesus says, be on guard against that. That's not what life is all about. And he tells them a parable to help them get that. Verse 16. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And this guy thinks to himself, hmm, what should I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, hmm, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. See, the guy in this story is storing up treasure for himself. His treasure, what he's living for, is here in this life. And what is it all about? It's all about two things. He is all about possessions and comfort. He's all about the stuff that he can get and he's all about the way that he feels. He wants the biggest and he wants the best barns. He wants to kick back, relax, and have an easy life. And if we're being honest here this morning, doesn't that sound nice? It, like at, at the core, isn't that kind of what all of us want? I mean, we want the nicest clothes. We want the nicest things. We want the most stuff. We want the easiest job that will make us the most money so we can do as close to nothing as possible. That's why everybody wants to grow up to be a YouTuber. 
right? Because you can make millions of dollars, but all people have to do is hit the like and subscribe button and smash the bell, ring the notifications, drop the comment below, whatever it is. Clearly, I'm cultured. <laughs> this is what we want. But what happens to this guy? Right when he gets everything that he wants in this life, he dies. And then what happens to all of his stuff? It gets passed on to someone else. You can't take it with you to heaven. And God says, Jesus says in this parable, fool, if you are living for this life, you are a fool. You got no treasure in heaven and it just might come at the cost of your soul. Don't do it. Go with me to Luke chapter 18. And in Luke chapter 18, you'll see the opposite. You'll see what it looks like to lay up treasure in heaven as a, as a, as a ruler comes to Jesus and he asks him a question. This is Luke 18 verse 18. A ruler came to Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds in Luke 18 verse 19 by saying, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And I want you to notice the ruler's response in verse 21. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. So maybe you're familiar with this story. Maybe you've heard about it before. It's often referred to as the story of the rich young ruler. And we think about this rich young ruler as the kind of guy who's out there living it up in the world. Right? He's got it made. He hits the party on Friday nights, but he's bringing in the Benjamins throughout the week. He's driving the nicest car. He's got the nicest clothes. He's the guy that everybody thinks they want to be. That's not who this guy is. Do you know who this guy is? He's you. He's the kind of guy that went to high school ministry. Because when Jesus says to him, Hey, here's what you got to do. You, you want to get to heaven? You want eternal life? Okay, you got to keep all of these commandments. And the point that Jesus is making is you can't keep these commandments because if you really kept all these commandments, you would be perfect and nobody is perfect. So he's trying to help him understand this point, but the guy's not missing it. But still, you have to notice his response is, hey, I've kept all these things from my youth. From the youth ministry. I was doing everything that I was supposed to do. I was in church trying to be a good person. Trying to do the right thing. That's who Jesus is talking to. And then Jesus, he said this in verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, Hey, one thing you still lack. And this is what it comes down to for so many people. They'll give 90% to Jesus, but there's one thing they just want to hold on to. Jesus says, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And I want you to notice how Peter, his disciple, responds in verse 28 to this whole scene. Peter says in verse 28, See, Lord, we have left our homes. We've left our families. We've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said to his disciples in verse 29, Truly, I say to you, there is no one no one, and that includes you and me, who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. What does it look like to store up treasure in heaven? Jesus says, leave everything. Leave it all. And come, follow Jesus. Don't wait. Decide today. And I want you to notice how in verse 29, Jesus makes it very clear. If you leave something now for the kingdom later, you will be rewarded for that. 
That's storing up treasure in heaven that someday you will get to inherit when you are there. See, so many people, and I'm concerned you might fit into this category, have it all wrong. People who go to church, call themselves Christians, they think, oh great, I'll believe in Jesus, become a Christian, and then I can just have an easy, nice, comfortable life, and I get to go to heaven when I die. Which sounds like a win-win, right? That is not what Jesus says. Jesus says, you believe in him, and you live for the kingdom now. It's not that you just get the kingdom later. You live for him now. Every single day. You decide what you're going to do based on what's going to make the biggest impact a hundred years from now. That's what determines your decisions. To follow Jesus, you have to be willing to reprioritize things in your life that feel important to you for the sake of the kingdom. I mean, these disciples, they left behind their homes, which would have been the symbol of comfort. They left behind their families. We know that Peter was married. He left behind his wife to follow Jesus. Write this down for point number two. Prioritize the kingdom first. And I want to ask you that here this morning. A very important question for you to start considering as a high schooler. What are your priorities? You know what priorities are? The things in life that matter to you. The things in life that you make time for. The things in life that you're going to decide to do because they are important to you. What are your priorities? This past week I was reading a book on high schoolers. It's just called Gen Z. It's really a research book that shows a lot of things about high schoolers today. And in this book there was a report about thousands of high schoolers that have been asked what are their priorities. The question was what do you want to accomplish before you're 30? What are your priorities? And here were some of the answers. 66% of teenagers say that their number one priority before they turn 30 is to finish their education and start a career. Second on their priority list, 65% say become financially independent. Third, 55% say follow my dreams. Fourth, 38% say enjoy life before having the responsibilities of being an adult. Which when I read that, I kind of chuckled to myself because this is before you turn 30. You're an adult when you turn 18. So uh, they kind of missed the mark there. Uh, number five on the priority list, find out who you really are. Which is like, that sounds nice. You should probably find out who you really are. 21% ranked number six, travel to other countries. And I was surprised that this one was this low on the list before 30. 20% said get married. And then number eight on the list with 16% ranking this as a priority out of thousands of teenagers become more mature spiritually. Prioritize their faith is another way that maybe we would say it. And I know what you're thinking because I know you. You're here at United on a Sunday morning. You're thinking, Shane, come on. That's the world out there. That's thousands of high schoolers. That's Gen Z. We're here at United, Shane. Okay? Sunday morning, we got our Bibles open. We take things seriously around here. Those aren't my priorities. And you might say something along the lines of priority number one, faith. Priority number two, family and friends. Priority number three, school. Priority number four, sports. Priority number five, job. Something along those lines. Which sounds nice, doesn't it? You hear that and you're like, oh, quick. Way to go. Upstanding young person. But hey, we've all got to realize there's a difference between what you say your priorities are and what you show your priorities are. So what are your priorities? Go back with me to Matthew chapter 6 and I want to show you what your priorities are. Because in this passage, Jesus gives us three truths about where you are storing up your treasure. And I want to turn them into questions for you here this morning to help you identify where your priorities currently are right now. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 21. Jesus says in verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
See, you don't have to wonder where your treasure is here today. You don't have to think, hmm, am I storing up treasure in heaven or am I storing up treasure here on earth? Am I living for now or am I living for eternity? You don't have to wonder. You don't have to think. You don't have to be confused. You just have to ask yourself, where is your heart? And you're thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't help because my heart's right here. <laughs> so how does that show me where I'm storing up my treasure? Well, in the Bible, the heart is used in a lot of different ways. We see examples in the Bible of the heart being used as a picture of what you think about. Other times in the Bible, we see the heart being used as a picture of your emotions and your desires and what you want. Other times, we see the heart in the Bible being used as a picture of your decisions and what you do. And so what Jesus is saying, hey, you want to know where your treasure is? What do you think about most? What determines your decisions and influences how you live? What do you desire most? For where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Question number one here this morning, what do you desire most? What do you want most? What do you think about most? See, you prioritize what you desire. What you want, what you desire, you will prioritize. If you say Jesus is important to you and you say you desire a relationship with him, then I would just challenge you, look at your schedule. Does the time that you give to him throughout your week reflect that you really are actually prioritizing him first? And some of you guys would say, whoa, 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 bro. Hey, that is, that's not fair, okay? Because I've got this thing. I know you're an adult and you don't have it anymore, but I got this thing called school. And I got these things called jobs. So it's not fair for you to ask that question because I got to go to school like every day for like eight hours a day. There's no way I could just spend eight hours with Jesus. Okay, but at the same time, how many things do you voluntarily bring into your life? that you do not need or have to do, but those become the things that end up choking out what you say is the most important to you. Like I am, I, let the record show, I am a fan of sports. Okay, my mom is actually here this morning, everybody, which is super cool. Can we give her a round of applause? I would not be here if it were not for that lady. So, and she could testify to this. Growing up, I played almost every single sport imaginable. I know it's hard to imagine that nowadays, but it's true. Okay, I was on a soccer team. I was on a baseball team. I was on, yes, a basketball team. I played football. I played volleyball. I did it all. Okay, and I, there are so many good things that you can learn from being on a sports team. Okay, you learn discipline. You learn how to work hard. You learn how not to quit when you don't like it because the coach is annoying and you want to give up, but you have to keep on doing it because you signed up and you paid the fee. You learn how to work with teammates, all of those things. But newsflash, I clearly did not go pro in any of those sports, okay? But at one point, it was every single one of those. I thought to myself, yeah, you know, I think I do want to be a pro football player when I grow up. You know, I do think I want to be a pro soccer player when I grow up. And at some point, I had to come to the realization, it's not going to happen. Which means I am doing this temporarily. This isn't even what my life is going to be all about five years from now. Which means you have to wrestle with the same question. And honestly, in your heart, you have to come to a conclusion here this morning. What can you do with your life that will matter most 100 years from now? And if you're doing things right now that you know, dude, that's keeping me from something that will matter most 100 years from now. And this is temporary and I'm prioritizing this more than other things that matter to Jesus, don't store up treasure here on this earth. Don't live for now. For some of you guys, I mean, that might mean you got to talk to your parents about quitting your club team because your club team is consistently keeping you from 
not just coming to church. I mean, so it, it, you realize that, right? Like it is not about just coming to church. You check the box. You did it on the weekend. And maybe if you can, you'll do it on a Thursday night. If you are a Christian, you are the church. So yes, you come to church. But it's not just to come to church. You, if you are a Christian, you are the church, which means you're supposed to be all about seeing the church get built up. That this isn't a place that you come to just to meet some quota and I was there on Saturday or I was there on Sunday and then I checked in with my small group on Thursday night. No, this is the place where you serve. This is the place where you give yourself. This is the place where you love people. This is the place where it's not like I've got my church friends and then I've got my real friends. You all know how that works? No, it's like this is my family. This is what I'm all about. This is what I'm giving my life to. This is my priority. Because Jesus is my priority and he gave his life for the church and now he saved me and I'm a part of the church so that's what I'm going to prioritize. Reprioritize maybe. And yeah, it might come at a cost. You might have to distance yourself from that relationship because if you're being honest, you're not influencing them for the gospel. They're influencing you towards sin. But whatever you give up, whatever cost you pay to invest your life into the kingdom, it'll be so worth it. Do you realize that here this morning? Do you believe that here this morning? That whatever you give up to invest for Jesus, it will be worth it. Okay, did you know, I don't know if you know this, I learned this this past week. How many of you guys have heard of Tesla? Yeah, I mean, silly question, right? We see them all over the place. Did you know that Tesla is not even a 20-year-old company? It started in 2003. Which is crazy because of how much it's blown up, right? I mean, we see Teslas all over the place now. So this is a, like a, a young, what used to be small company that is now huge. If I came to you when it was first starting in 2003 and I said, hey, do you want to invest in Tesla? You would have to make a decision then based on the limited knowledge you have. Do you think it's worth it to invest in Tesla? Okay, if, if, if somehow though, we were able to get into a time machine and go back to 2003 with the knowledge that we all have about Tesla today, that it's going to blow up and it's going to go huge and Elon Musk is going to buy the moon and he's going to take over the world and it's going to get crazy. And I said to you in 2003, hey, do you want to invest in Tesla? What would be the obvious answer? Yes! Of course I want to invest in Tesla. What, I mean, do you not know how, where this is going to go? Yes, of course I want to. And so, guys, you have to get this. To invest in something, it, it, it's going to be a cost, right? You're giving up your money. That doesn't feel good in the moment. But if you know where it's going, you'll do it because the return on your investment will make it worth it. Guys, we don't have to wonder where this life is going. We know. Have you read the Bible? We know how this thing ends. It ends with two words. Jesus wins. Heaven is coming and it's real. And it's a lot longer than this life. And so you don't have a limited knowledge. Hmm, do I want to invest in Jesus? Will that be worth it? You know it will be worth it. Invest in what is most worth your life. The kingdom. Jesus. Look at what Jesus goes on to say in verse 22. He says, Matthew chapter 6 verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. And now here Jesus, he switches analogies from your heart and desires to your eyes and mind. But he's still talking about the same thing. He's still trying to help you see what do you live for? Do you prioritize the kingdom? Are you living your life right now? like eternity is real and seeking to make as big of an impact for the kingdom as you possibly can. And so when Jesus talks about your eye, he's talking about what you allow yourself to see, what you choose to put in front of you, what you watch, where you scroll, the games you play, the music you listen to you. It's all shaping you. 
Do you understand that? What you put in is influencing you. Okay, every app that you download, every show that you watch, every account you follow, every song you shuffle, it's all forming your thoughts, your emotions, your beliefs to make you a certain kind of a person. And this world is not neutral. Everything that we're putting in us is either light or darkness. It's either profitable, useful for the kingdom, or it's temporary and it's not going to last in eternity. Question number two, what do you look at most? I want to challenge you here this morning, just compare your screen time to your scripture time. I mean, don't do it right now because it'll be overwhelmingly convicting, but you could literally open up your phone after the sermon, pull up your screen time, compare that to how much time you're getting your eyeballs in the Bible and spending time with Jesus. Did you know that it's reported that 57% of teenagers spend four or more hours on a screen every day? And that's like for recreational use. That's not like schoolwork. Did you know that 27% of teenagers spend eight or more hours on a screen per day? That's watching videos, listening to music, playing video games. Do you know what researchers are calling you? Yeah, I mean, technically you're Gen Z, which kind of gets me excited because Z is the last alpha letter in the alphabet, so apparently we're the last generation until Jesus comes, so that's exciting. But do you know what they're calling Gen Z nowadays? You're no longer teenagers. They call you screenagers. Does that upset you? Like, how does that land on you? Because I'll tell you how it landed on me this past week when I read that. That upsets me. Because I read that and I think to myself, ah, the world is looking at you and thinking, Psh, teenagers, stupid, you're just wasting your life on the screen. You're just giving your life to social media or video games. And it upsets me because you don't have to. And I know some of you guys here this morning, you don't want to. But you have to wake up to the reality that life is so much bigger than doing whatever feels good or you want to just in the moment. So what's that going to look like? Here at United, one of the things we want to do is we want to challenge you to take God's word seriously so you'll actually do it. But also, we want to equip you and we want to show you, hey, here's a better option. Here's what you can do instead. One of the things that we would recommend every single person here at United has is their own copy of the Bible. Okay, here at Compass Bible Church, we have ESV. That's the version that we use. If you do not have an English standard version copy of the Bible, I will buy you one after the service is over. You need your own Bible. Okay, what we would really recommend is not just that you would have a Bible and bring it with you to church and follow along as I preach the sermons to you, but what we really want is we want you to read that Bible every single day of your life. And so here at this church, there's a way that we do that. Who's heard of scripture of the day? Anybody heard of scripture of the day? We do this thing here at the church where we read the Bible and we do it together. One chapter, Monday through Friday, every day, and tomorrow we are starting the book of Romans. And I want to invite you to read the book of Romans with me. And I actually, I'm going to challenge you here this morning. I don't want you just to read Romans. I want you to take it seriously. So much so that every single day you would take time not just to read it, but to think about it. And to try to figure out how you're going to apply it. And what that's going to look like in your life. So much so that you would even be able to share that with someone. And so here's my challenge to the United, and I'm in on this, okay? I shared this last night with the service. I'll share it with you again. We have this YouTube page where every single day a whole team of people from our church put up a video that helps you understand the chapter that we're reading. It's called Scripture of the Day. And I want to start challenging United that not only should you read a chapter of the Bible every day, but you should think through what it means to you, what encourages you, what you're going to go and do about it. And I want you to start leaving that thought in a comment on the video every single day. And I'm going to do this. 
Okay, this is my personal goal, challenge, leading United, moving forward every Monday through Friday. If you pull up the YouTube video and you do not see my name with a comment about the scripture and what I'm going to do by 7 a.m., you can call me out. 949-463-3706. That's my cell phone number. You have full permission. Text me the emoji of smoke coming out of the nostrils and rebuke me. Okay. And here's the reason why I'm challenging you to do this. The reason why I'm challenging you to do this is not because we need another box that we can put on our check the box Christianity list to feel good about ourselves. Oh look, not only did I read the Bible, but cool, I commented on scripture today. You know why we need this? Because we need accountability. That's why we need this. Because if you're anything like me, you can hear a sermon just like this and you can be like, yeah! Ugh! Stop living for this life. Start living for eternity. Let's go! Yes, I'm in. Get it? Come on. I'm about it. And then you leave this room and you pull out your phone and you open up Instagram and you see a post and bam, it's all gone. And everything that God's doing in your heart and your life right now in this moment, it's out the door. We need accountability. And not only do we need to read the scripture every day, every day, but there are some books that we would recommend every single person here at United Reads before they graduate. How many of you guys have heard of Exploring the Gospel? Have you heard of Exploring the Gospel? This is something every single one of you needs to do with a small group leader before you graduate. Okay, if you have not done that, here's your sermon application. When the sermon is done, walk up to your small group leader. If they're not here today, come up to me, ask them, I want to read and talk about exploring the gospel. Will you do it with me? And start doing it with them. Okay, then we've got these other books that we're going to get in our bookstore by next weekend. For the young men, we've got this book called Thoughts for Young Men that we would encourage every young man to read before you graduate. Then we've got this book for the ladies called This Changes Everything. Do you know that this book, which is all about how the gospel transforms the teen years, was written by a high school girl named Jaquel Crow? And this book blew up and became a national bestseller. And she wrote it when she was in high school. Guys, you can do something with your life. I mean, serious. You can do something with your life that matters. You can make an impact by what you do right now that lasts for eternity. You don't have to waste your life. People are doing it. Another book that we would recommend is this book called Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. I read this book right after I became a Christian with three other high school guys and a small group leader. We met up every other Friday night at Panda Express and talked about Pursuit of Holiness. And I can tell you those nights changed my life and had nothing to do with the chow mein and orange chicken. Although it is life changing. <laughs> Don't waste your life. Look at the last thing Jesus says in this passage. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Verse 24, here's Jesus ending this passage. He says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now the specific example that Jesus uses here in this verse is money, but the principle could be applied to really any good thing in life. You cannot serve school and God. You cannot serve family and God. You cannot serve your sports team and God. Now we need to be careful because all of those things are good things. They're not bad things, right? School is not a bad thing. Some of you guys, you need to agree more with that one. Sports is not a bad thing. Money is not a bad thing. These are good things. So what does Jesus mean when he says you cannot serve God and money? Does that mean in order for you to be a Christian, you have to take a vow of poverty? Uh, I gotta be poor for Jesus. Can't have anything nice. Can't wear cool clothes. Can't drive nice cars. Can't have a, a, get any money. No, just give it away. Go find the local homeless guy and buy him some food. Is that what this means? Now you got to understand, there's a difference between you serving something and you using something to serve Jesus. You can't live for God and money. Money can't be your number one. You can't live for sports and money. You can't live for school and God. You can't live for family and God. You can only have one master. So the question you got to ask yourself with whatever it is in your life is do you serve it 
or do you use it to serve Jesus? See, you should want money. You should want lots of money. Not because you love money and you're living for money. No, because you are a Christian who uses everything in your life to serve Jesus. Because when guys like me or Pastor Bobby or whoever it is jumps up on stage and says, hey guys, we want to get a new auditorium, but it's going to cost us $4 million. We should have Christians who make so much money that they're like, awesome, here's a check for $4 million. Let's get it. You should want money. Maybe you should play on your sports team, but do not live for your sport. If it becomes more of a priority to you than Jesus... If it takes more of your time than the things of Jesus, you're serving it. You're not using it to serve Jesus. So ask yourself that question of anything on your priority list and then you've got to decide here today. What are you going to live for? I don't know if you know this, but in the early 1970s, there was a young man who wanted to make a movie. And the movie that he wanted to make was about this unseen world in space. And so in order to make the movie, he went around to people and he asked them if they would invest to help him make his movie. And so he would go to people and he would pitch his idea. Hey, I've got this idea. I want to make this movie. It's about this unseen world in space. And do you know what every single person did? Every single person laughed at him and said, nope, nobody funded this guy's movie. And somehow the guy still made the movie just on a super low quality budget. His name was George Lucas and it was Star Wars. You know, nobody invested in it. Everybody thought the original, a movie about an unseen world in space? <laughs> Who's going to watch that? That's lame. And now, what do we know? It's one of the most famous series of all time. So much so that Disney bought it and ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> and we know. What, what, what do we know? We know how good it is, right? But back then, everybody was like, Psh, that's stupid. Why are you going to do that? You got to decide here today. What are you going to invest your life into? What are you going to give your time to? What are you going to give your thoughts to? What's going to influence your decisions? Because if you decide here today that you're going to store up your treasure in heaven, guess what the world's going to think? The world's going to look at you and be like, Psh, you're stupid. It's like Star Wars. You're going to live for an unseen world in space? What? Are you kidding me? And a hundred years from now, everybody's going to know. There's only one life. It's done really, really fast. And only what you do for Christ will truly last. Let me pray for us. And then we're going to close out our song, our service with one last song. Let's all pray. Father in heaven, we come before you here this morning. Thank you so much for the clear words of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he's saying to us here today about fasting and storing up treasure in heaven. God, if we're being honest, this is hard. This is challenging to prioritize the things of the kingdom so first in our lives that they would become the most important thing to us. It's so different than what everybody else is doing and most people would look at us and think, that's stupid. What are you doing with your life? Why are you living for that? God, but help us to remember here this morning that we only get one life. It is over really, really fast and only what we do for Christ will last. And so I pray here today that you would help every single one of us to decide that we are going to live not for what feels best or seems most exciting in the moment, but we're going to live every single day of our lives. Every single moment of our days. Doing what's going to matter most a hundred years from now. God, heaven is coming. Some of us are so excited for it. It's going to be here so soon and we're longing for it. We want to be there with you, but help us not to miss these moments. God, I honestly think that some of us, when we get to heaven and when we see your son Jesus and we see for the first time, really, just how worthy he is, and we're like, oh, he's amazing. 
And this place called heaven, it's so beautiful. In that moment when we can finally get it, some of us will long to come back to this life. Because when we understand there how worthy he is, we will want to come back here and give more for him. Because we won't have the opportunity to do that when we're with him. Help us to realize that we right now are living in the moments that we will long for when we get to heaven. That this is the time that you have given us to make an impact for the kingdom. God, I just pray that we would not waste our lives. Pray that we would not waste our time. God, I get it's difficult. I understand it's hard. I feel it every single day of my life. Just help us. Put it on our hearts to listen to Jesus and decide to obey. We pray this in his name.